Good afternoon, everyone. And the next item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. We now move to portfolio questions, which is questions on social justice, communities and pensioner rights. Question one, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with third sector organisations regarding changes to funding allocated under schemes such as a Community Innovation Fund. Thank you. Minister Mark Obiagi. In a challenging funding environment, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting the development of a capable, sustainable and enterprising third sector. We recognise the pressures faced by the third sector at a time when it has a key role to play in helping drive forward public sector reform and prevention and will continue to invest in supporting third sector capacity and sustainability. The Cabinet Secretary uh, will join the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance at a meeting with the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations and other third sector leaders on the 11th of November to discuss the spending review. We will continue to work collaboratively with the sector on a strategic approach to social enterprise and with a wide range of stakeholders, including Big Scotland and independent funders, to explore opportunities to maximise the resources available to support the work of the sector. Thank you. Ms Smith. Uh, could I thank the Minister for the answer? Uh, I asked the question uh, on account of concerns that have been expressed by groups such as Perth Autism Support, which have found it very difficult to access the Community Innovation Fund, despite their belief that they are actually fulfilling the relevant criteria when they support 400 families in the Perth and Kinross area affected by autism, and when that support is actually not available through other statutory partners. Could I ask the Minister to look at this, as it's obviously a very serious concern for the families affected and the groups doing their level best to help them? Minister, briefly. The, in our Scottish landscape, there are in fact two community innovation funds, and I'm assuming the one that is being referred to is the one from the NHS Tay side. The fund in question uh, was developed to, in response to the consultation which showed that people were concerned not just with health but with wider environmental factors and groups were invited to apply for a share of funds on that basis to establish projects to take action to affect everyday lives of people in communities under these headings. This is an important fund that has recently been relaunched and I would be happy to look at how NHS Tayside are operating it and the concerns that the member highlights. Excellent. Question to Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that charities with social welfare objectives should make ethical investment decisions that are consistent with those objectives rather than seek to maximise income at all costs. Minister Margaret Burgess. The legislative framework for Scotland's charities is the Charities and Trustees Investment Scotland Act 2005. The Act sets out the general duty of care that charity trustees must follow, which includes a requirement that the charity trustees act in the interest of the charity and seek to ensure that the charity acts consistently with its purposes. The trustees of a charity are free to make decisions for their charity as long as these are within the powers of the law and the terms of their governing document. The Scottish Government expects trustees to select investments that are right for their charity. This means taking account of how suitable any investment is for the charity and to take advice where appropriate from someone experienced in investment matters. Thanks, Malcolm uh, Thank the Minister for that answer. But given that some charities seem to think they are obliged to achieve the maximum income possible when they dispose of assets or make investment decisions, will the government issue guidance making it clear that it is perfectly proper for charities, especially charities with social welfare objectives, to take account of community benefit and community harm when disposing of assets and making investment decisions? Minister. I will certainly discuss that with my colleague Fergus Ewing, who is re responsible for uh, the charities uh, and how they operate. But clearly, um, that, that is clear that they're not required to take, make those investments, and that is clear in the, the, the Charities Act. But however, I will discuss with uh, my colleague to see if there's anything that the Scottish Government can do to make that clearer to charities. Thanks. Question three, Graham Pearson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of local government budget reductions on poverty rates. Minister Mark 
Despite the significant cuts that Westminster has imposed on this Parliament's budget, the Scottish Government has protected the funding it provides to local authorities. The local government finance settlements have been maintained over the period 2012-16 with extra money for additional responsibilities and as a result the total settlement in 2015-16 now amounts to over £10.85 billion. Thanks, Graham Pearson. I am grateful for that uh, reply. Does the Government agree that cuts made to local government finance plus the centralised council tax freeze has forced up care charges on some of the most vulnerable elderly and disabled people in Scotland? Uh, will the Minister indicate support for my colleague Siobhan McMahon's bill, which seeks to address this growing problem? Minister. Firstly, it should be said that local government in Scotland does very well financially and has done much better than English local authorities, according to any independent analysis of how the two governments have responded to the same financial pressures. As my colleague Shona Robison has said on the issue of care charging uh, at the Public Petitions Committee, we are looking at the budgets ahead in discussions with COSLA extensively on this and have some, taken some early steps to uh, address some of the uh, issues that have been highlighted. The uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health, Shona Robison, has met with campaigners on this on a number of occasions and will continue to have that discussion both with campaigners and with COSLA. Thanks, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that the UK Government's policies for the next five years, particularly in relation to cuts in welfare, will push more households, especially those households with carers and people with long term conditions, and especially our children, into further poverty? Minister? I would completely agree. We have uh, the evidence in front of us on the tax credits as just one example that next year, if they do somehow go ahead following a, a fiat uh, of the Westminster Constitution, they would cost uh, the families that are affected £1,500 a year on average and they would affect a quarter of a million. And what we're not talking about here is that having been stopped. It has simply been delayed. Even Ruth Davidson has joined in the criticism of these measures and I would hope that we could have those powers here so that we could choose a different way on child and uh, family poverty. Many thanks. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister accept the conclusions of the recent report from SPICE, which found that whilst the UK, the Conservatives, have passed on a 3% cut to Scottish Government funding, the SNP ministers have in turn passed on a 6% cut to local government finance? What impact has those cuts had on vulnerable elderly and disabled citizens in local areas? Minister. I would not agree. The Dell reduction of the Scottish uh, budget has been around 10 per cent, but I would perhaps agree with another point in the SPICE report, which highlights that the council tax freeze, which I, I can't remember if Labour are in favour of or against it this week, has been overfunded by an estimated £165 million. Question for Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Fife Council and what issues were discussed. Mr Mark Biaggi. The Scottish Government engages regularly with Fife Council and all other local authorities in Scotland on a wide range of issues. Clear Baker. Um, housing will play an important part in the successful delivery of integrated health and social care. Um, Fife Council are investing significantly in affordable housing, but the complex needs of, for example, um, suitable retirement housing that might require some kind of care element is what will be needed in the future if the joined up social care agenda is going to work. Um, what discussions is the Minister and the, um, the, the whole team having with the Cabinet Secretary for Health to support the role of local government in delivering integrated social and health care? Minister. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing herself met with the Chair of NHS Fife and the Leader of Fife Council to discuss delayed discharges but also the, the wider uh, operation of the Integration Joint Board on the 8th of October. This is an area we pay particular attention to in, in part because of the importance for delayed discharge but also because this is a key part of public sector reform that we want to uh, get right. Now, I would be happy to have uh, discussions with the member if there are specific uh, obstacles or specific issues uh, about that programme that need to be highlighted and addressed. Many thanks. Question five, Richard Simpson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made towards achieving its target that no person will live in fuel poverty by t November 2016. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neill. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to eradicating fuel poverty as far as is reasonably practicable by November 2016 and is making available a record budget of £119 million this year to help achieve this. 
However, the major challenges to meeting the target are households, household incomes and rising fuel prices over which we have no control. Thank you, Dr Simpson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Winter deaths in Scotland last year were at their highest for 15 years. Figures show that far from reaching or achieving fuel poverty target, fuel poverty peaked in 2013 with almost a million houses or four in ten of all households in Scotland living in fuel poverty, with 252,000 of those in extreme fuel poverty. Does the Minister agree with Theresa Fife of the RCN saying it's indefensible that cold, hard-to-heat homes continue to leave the most vulnerable in our society at the mercy of cold weather each winter? And what assurances will the Minister give that the target is now going to be back on track and will be met by November 2016. Kemsey. Presiding officer, as I said in my original answer, we are spending a record amount, £119 million this year, on dealing with fuel poverty. But that's against the background of very substantial cuts in welfare benefits and the impact that has had, as well as the impact of the recession over the last five years in terms of the increase in unemployment, which is fortunately beginning trend-wise to come down again, uh, and also the impact on the standard of living, particularly the incomes of low-paid people. And that's why fuel poverty has been a much greater challenge in recent times than it had been prior to the recession. Many thanks. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, could the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary provide an estimate of how many people would be in fuel poverty if the cost of fuel had increased in line with inflation since 2011? Cabinet Secretary. Spontaneous Presid answer here, please. Pre Pre <laughs> Presiding officer, our initial estimate is that if the cost of fuel had increased in line with inflation since mid-2011, there would have been 743,000 households in fuel poverty in 2013. This is equivalent to a fuel poverty rate of 30.9%, which is 2.3 percentage points lower than the fuel poverty rate in mid-2011, and would have been 9 percentage points lower than the fuel poverty rate for 2013. I just happened to have that information ready to hand. Well done. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, looking for the same level of spontaneity, the uh, Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the remarks of Norrie Kerr from Energy Action Scotland that the likelihood of us hitting that target uh, by November next year uh, are slim to vanishing. Does he not accept that it may be um, valuable at this stage to reappraise that target so that everybody involved in this sector can redouble efforts and focus on an achievable target, not just for next year, but for the medium to longer term? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we have well over a year to go before the target has to be met and uh, any reassessment will be done much nearer the time once we are uh, we know the situation after the spending review on the 25th of November and then after the budget next year because all of these decisions will impact on the level of fuel poverty in Scotland. And if I may say so, if the reductions in tax credits go ahead, that further will aggravate the fuel poverty problem in Scotland. And it's a great pity that the Liberal Democrats sustained the Tories in power for five years because it's a result of the measures introduced in some cases by Liberal Democrat ministers. That they re that's the reason why fuel poverty is so high in Scotland today. Neil Finlay. Given his tremendous powers of recall, I wonder if he could tell us the five years prior to the ones he's just read out. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, uh, to save your time, I'll write to the member. <laughs> Many thanks. Question six, George Adam. <laughs> Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government how town centres could benefit from business rates being set by local authorities. Minister Mark Biaggi. The Scottish Government is committed to giving communities real control over their own futures. This substantial new power, delivered under the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, will give councils more control over business rates and an opportunity to tailor them to their local area. With these new flexibilities, councils could, for example, use their local knowledge to attract new investment into town centres and help create vibrant communities where people want to live, socialise and do business. Thanks, George Adam. Thank the Minister for his answer. When I first opened up my, my office in Paisley's Johnson Street, there were many empty shops, but we now have almost full occupancy. Now, although I'd like to claim credit, I, can't, but I do not believe that it's all my doing. But does the Minister agree with me that policies like the small business bonus and the devolution of business rates to a local level will encourage businesses to open in our town centres? Sir? 
Yes, the benefits of the small business bonus scheme are, are very clear, having reduced or removed business rates bills for more than two in every five rateable properties in Scotland. And the FSB has commented that the small business bonus continues to give most Scottish small firms a competitive advantage over counterparts in other parts of the UK. But the, with the newly devolved power for councils to reduce rates bills, councils could use their powers as they choose, whether for town centres or other localities, for individuals individual properties, particular growth sectors, etc. And I really look forward to some further innovative thinking in this regard. The ball is in the court of the local authorities that have had this power decentralised to them. And the Scottish Government will continue to work in partnership with any councils that are interested in using this power to explore further opportunities. Thanks. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, town centres can indeed benefit from locally set up business rates as long as they are lowered to incentivise businesses to set up and prosper in the area. However, will the Scottish Government specifically assess how business rates being set by local authorities could benefit the local consumers? Yes, uh, we will be producing some factual guidance on this power that councils will be able to use. We will keep it broadly under review as we do any power. But this is a power to vary business rates downwards, which I'm sure the member would applaud, which will probably only assist businesses and which we have very high hopes for uh, when councils apply it creatively. We don't want to stifle their innovation of it. So a few years down the line, it would be appropriate to consider that again. But this is very much a ball that is in the court of local authorities, and I trust them to, to use it very well. Thanks. Question seven, then Ed Milne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many council tenants it estimates would have exercised their right to buy, but will no longer be able to after the 1st of August next year. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government estimates over a 10-year period that up to 15,500 houses will not be sold as a result of ending right to buy on 1 August 2016. These homes will be kept within current stock to the benefit of tenants and local communities across Scotland. Thank you. Dr Mill. The Minister for that answer. I have been contacted by a number of constituents who, having expressed an interest in buying their homes, have had this right postponed because the local council has designated their homes as part of a pressure area. Since the Scottish Government has moved to end the right to buy policy for all council and housing association tenants in Scotland on the 1st of August next year, these constituents have now discovered that, having already expressed an interest in buying their homes, this right has now been totally removed. What advice would the Minister give to these tenants who clearly want to own their own homes and who now have no other route to achieve that aspiration? Minister. What I would say, when local authorities uh, create pressured areas because of the, the, the supply of housing stock in their area and can continue to extend that, so in any case, those tenants would, could have had that extension of the pressured area continued year on year on year, so effectively wouldn't have the, had the right to buy in any case. But what I can say to the member is that this Scottish Government has a number of other uh, schemes in place to help people onto the housing market. We have our low our open market shared equity scheme. We ought to, for people who want to, to move into owner occupancy. We also had the Help to Buy scheme, which the First Minister announced will continue with the Help to Buy scheme for those that want to purchase a new home. So, and, and I would also say that our, our abolition of right to buy was a very popular measure among tenants, among all housing associations and housing professionals, and has allowed local authorities, uh, given them the confidence to build council houses now that, without losing them to their stock. So there are other measures in place for those who do want to buy their home. Thanks. Question 8, Mark MacDonald. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its plans are for carers' allowance when it is devolved. Secretary Alec Neil. Presiding officer, this Government recognises the vital role that carers fulfil by caring for their family, friends and neighbours, and they make a tremendous contribution to our society. The support they receive in the form of carers' allowance is the lowest of all working age benefits. Our view is that it is simply not fair. I am delighted that the First Minister announced recently that when powers over carers' allowance are devolved, an SNP government will begin to increase carers' allowance so that it is paid at the same level as job seekers' allowance. This will give carers around £600 more a year. 
Okay, thanks. Mark McDonald. Uh, thank you, President. So I declare my interest as my wife is a recipient of carer's allowance. But uh, I welcome the announcement from the First Minister. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me, though, that it would be welcome if either the autumn statement or the upcoming budget, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, were to take the position that carers should have carer's allowance uprated? But does he agree that, given over the many years that SNP members, including my late colleague Brian Adam, have been raising this with the UK Government, it has failed to happen, it is more likely that we will have to wait for this Government and this Parliament to have the powers before carers get the, the equality that they deserve. Sir. Sir, I wholeheartedly agree with every point that Mark Macdonald makes. Thanks. And so we will now move to the second set of portfolio questions on fair work skills and training. Question one, Sarah Boyack. The Scottish Government, when the Long Annex Task Force and PACE team will report on the interventions they have made with the workers and apprentices affected by the power station's closure. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, the Scottish Government's PACE team has been in discussions with Scottish power and supply chain companies to offer PACE support and is implementing tailored programmes of support for affected workers where the offer of support has been accepted. I can confirm that there are no apprentices at Long Gannett. Long Gannett Power Station is going to remain fully operational until 31st of March next year. Uh, however, a resource centre is being established to provide direct support on site for employees of Scottish Power and for employees of on-site contractors, uh, and that will be in place from mid-November 2015. In addition to the range of PACE support which will be provided, plans are also being developed for a jobs fair to be held on site in January 2016. We monitor the impact of our PACE interventions on affected employees, and regular progress reports are provided in the Long Gannett Task Force, chaired by the Minister for Business. The next meeting of the Long Gannett Task Force is scheduled to be held early in 2016, and I'll ensure that the member receives a copy of the PACE update from that. Thank you very much. Sarah Boyett. Can I thank the Minister for that response? I think it's extremely useful. Can, you, can the Minister clarify how much financial and staffing resource has been invested to engage with the workers at Long Annet, um, particularly given that I understand that um, over 50 per cent of them are over 50, um, to make sure that we can tailor that assistance and to retain their skills in Scotland's energy sector and to make sure that we can make the economic transition we need to make in terms of renewables and green energy in Fife in particular. For information with regard to how much uh, is currently uh, being spent in terms of the resourcing of the uh, um, PACE uh, involvement, we are conscious of the uh, age uh, range of the employees uh, and the significant number who are over 50, which is why so much work is actually being done in respect of uh, employee support. Um, there is a draft recovery, economic recovery plan uh, uh, being considered, um, and that was looked at on the 29th of September, which is when the task force last met, um, and that the meeting of the task force in January 2016 is to allow officials to progress uh, a variety uh, of work in that intervening period. And, for example, there's been another meeting uh, directly affecting employee support just on the 20th uh, of October. Um, so uh, the, the support will continue uh, to be put in place for affected employees. Uh, we are cognisant of the fact that the age range is as, as high as it is. Uh, as I indicated, that's evident in the fact that there are no apprentices. So uh, um, that is a factor in, in what has been looked at. Many thanks. Supplementary question about Long Gannett from Mr Gibson. In terms of the support that's actually been provided for those who are going to be made redundant as a result of the Longanic closure, will the report also include uh, the support that's been given to those in the supply chain, such as, for example, those at Hunterson uh, in my own constituency? Well, as, as the member may have, uh, if you'd been listening to my initial answer, will know that I'm not actually on uh, the task force. Um, uh, they are currently looking at uh, a variety of different uh, uh, options. They're working very closely with the contractors as well as with Scottish Power uh, directly uh, and uh, uh, all those who are directly affected by the closures, regardless of where they might be, uh, will be taken into consideration, I'm absolutely sure. But I would advise uh, uh, the member to uh, take up with, uh, with perhaps with Fergus Ewing more directly. If he has very specific concerns uh, around detailed aspects of that, that might be useful. Many thanks. Question two has not been lodged. Question three, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is reducing youth unemployment in West Scotland. 
Minister Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Government has invested in a wide range of employment initiatives that are directly helping to create sustainable employment opportunities for young people in the West Scotland constituency. These include uh, supporting over 10,000 modern apprenticeship starts in the last three years, supporting 621 young people through Community Jobs Scotland in the last three years, and uh, the allocation of funding to support 329 young people with particular barriers to employment and also at the same time to support employers uh, to recruit uh, modern apprentices from July 2015 to March 2016 through the Scotland's Employer Recruitment Incentive. Just as a point of information, I would point out that this information was collected obviously at local authority level, uh, therefore including Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire, Eastern Bartonshire, Renfrewshire, East Renfrewshire and North Ayrshire. Thanks, Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for that detailed answer? Is the Minister aware that Renfrewshire Council has reduced youth unemployment in the last three years from 10.9% to 2.2%, now below the Scottish average but stands at 2.6%? And will the Scottish Government take any lessons from the excellent work of my colleagues in Renfrewshire Council and its business partners to replicate these successes across West Scotland? Yes. I, I, I thank uh, the member for her uh, uh, information about the work of the local authority she referred to and obviously we welcome any initiative from whoever it comes from that will help to ensure that young people have access to a job because I think that's what everyone across the chamber wishes to see. I would just also, uh, in terms of us exchanging helpful information, point out that I was recently able to launch uh, at uh, West uh, College Scotland the uh, West Region Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Regional Grouping, which of course is to be a bridge as between employers and uh, schools in particular. Uh, so I think that's a very significant development for the West of Scotland and I'm sure that we all wish to see uh, uh, the regional group uh, have continued success in its, in its work to get young people uh, into the world of work. Thank you. Question for Neil Bibby. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what role it considers colleges play in providing skills and training opportunities for people in West Scotland. Um, West College is Scotland's second largest regional college, delivering education and training to 30,000 students, around 500 modern apprenticeships, and providing 12,000 hours of learning to 3,000 school pupils from their three main campus areas. The college works closely with industry partners to ensure each curriculum sector is aligned to both local and national industry, skills development opportunities for students are a priority, including work placement and industry-related skills development. Thank you. Neil Bibby. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recently, I've heard from a number of people who are concerned about the widely felt impact of college cuts on skills and training opportunities. The Cabinet Secretary will, will be aware that her government's cuts have resulted in the college budget being slashed by over £100 million in real terms since Labour were last in power. Will the Cabinet Secretary therefore give students and staff a commitment that there will not be another real terms cut to the college budget next year? And if not, given that the importance she places on colleges providing skills and training opportunities, will she lobby the Finance Secretary against further real terms cuts? Well, I'm in regular conversations with the Finance Sec Secretary about a very uh, great many things, as the uh, as the member might be aware, but I simply don't recognise the caricature that he's painting uh, about college funding. Uh, we are actually investing more in colleges than Labour ever did. Uh, college resource budget of £526 million in 2015-16, 16, well above Labour's highest level in 2006-07. Uh, and we've invested over Order. £530 million in college estates uh, in that same period of time, and that's £230 million more in cash terms than during Labour's time in office. Thank you, Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President, Deputy President Officer. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary admit that in order to reach that figure, she's ignoring inflation, capital, and the last year of the Labour administration? Cab set. Well, one could, one could argue that Labour is just as keen to ignore any and all of those things when it suits them uh, when it suits them as well. Um, we, have, we have invested record amounts of money into college funding. We are, we are making huge dividends in terms of the refocusing of the way the college system works in Scotland. We have far more full-time equivalent students, as the members know perfectly well. And the work that colleges are doing is now focused on employment and education, which is where it should be focused. Many thanks. Question five, Linda Fabiani. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed the trade union bill with the UK Government. Well, I discussed the trade union bill with Nick Bowles, Minister for Skills, on the 8th of October in a telephone conversation. This was followed up by my letter of 12th October, highlighting my concern that the bill, as currently drafted, leaves far too much scope uh, for abuse in the future. This legislation is an unwarranted ideological attack on the recognised rights of trade unions. The proposals it sets out are completely out of step with the partnership approach taken by this government. There's a real risk that this could undermine what we are trying to achieve in Scotland, and we, along with the STUC and many others, consider the bill to be highly regressive, and I've asked the UK government to completely exclude Scotland from it. Many thanks. I uh, now call on what? Linda Fabiani again. <laughs> That's very nice of you, President Officer. Thanks very much. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and ask that next time she meets with the UK Government, she tells them about Graham Smith, General Secretary of the STUC, addressing the SNP conference and saying quite clearly that this bill should be of concern not just to unions and their members, but to anyone concerned about democracy, human rights and civil liberties. And does she agree with me that all of those in Scotland who care about these things should join in opposition to this blatant attack to the rights of the people in Scotland? Yeah. Of course I agree with all of that, and I would have anticipated that at least my colleagues on the left over here might have agreed as well, uh, particularly given the comments by Graham Smith. Uh, I'm sure they agree with them, regardless of the platform on which he chooses to express them. I've made it clear on several occasions that I believe the trade union bill proposals have the potential to undermine the effective engagement of trade unions across Scottish workplaces and in particular across the Scottish public sector. And the proposals are in stark contrast with the work that we're trying to do, work that we set out through the Working Together Review response and the Fair Work Convention, where we're trying to build a stronger, more collaborative approach to the relationship between unions, employees uh, and employers. And our strategy reflects that of many of the most successful European countries. Uh, I believe that's the only way in which we'll be able to maintain the integrity of our more progressive approach of working in partnership with unions. And can I say, presiding officer, just as a final point, that I, and I hope everybody else here, would encourage every person who is in a workplace to join a trade union, uh, and that would be the best response to what is now emanating from Westminster. Many thanks. Question six, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government in which month the evaluation of the Youth Employment Scotland Fund will be completed and whether it will publish the full evaluation. Minister Annabel Yu. Uh, the evaluation is scheduled to be completed by end December 2015 and will subsequently be published in full thereafter. Thanks, Gavin Brown. Thank you. Um, why did the Scottish Government not evaluate the fund before replacing it? Minister. Uh, well, uh, what I would say, first of all, in terms of where we are with the evaluation is that uh, after an initial uh, delay into the procurement process, which I think the member may be aware of, um, the contractor now in place has reported that they've actually been having difficulties uh, in receiving responses from some local authorities. So that has impacted on the timescale uh, that, uh, that dictates when we will receive the evaluation. Uh, in terms of... Um, uh, the, the direct question, supplementary, that the, the member asked, I suspect he is referring to perhaps the recently launched Scotland's Employer Recruitment Incentive uh, Programme, but I'm not entirely sure, uh, because we have uh, proceeded with that uh, uh, Scotland's Employer Recruitment Incentive Programme, uh, it, picking up uh, lessons of good practice from where we have been to ensure that we have a, a more straightforward, easy to operate a uh, simple, flexible scheme that will focus on helping those with the most challenges to obtain a, a, a work experience and a job and to focus on micro and small businesses in order to provide them with the support that they may need in order to meet the cost of taking on uh, somebody in those circumstances uh, and also that it would be support provided for a duration uh, of a longer period than the uh, Youth Employment Scotland Fund. So I'm not entirely sure if that addresses the, the member's question. I am trying to be helpful, but the question was rather uh, vague in, in its terms. Any thanks? Question 7, Neil Finlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had, uh, what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work, Skills and Training has had with the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure and Investment in Cities regarding the impact of public sector procurement on employment policy. 
Yeah, thanks. Rosanna regular Cameron. discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities on these issues. I'm particularly conscious of the significant role that public sector procurement can play in promoting fair work, which is why I've been pleased to work with the Cabinet Secretary on the development of the statutory guidance which addresses fair work practices through public procurement. This is an important step forward, in particular as a way of encouraging more organisations to pay the living wage. It is through cross-government activities such as this that we are helping to create and nurture a culture of fair work that will ensure work improves people's lives and strengthens businesses so that everyone shares the benefits of a stronger, growing and more inclusive economy. Thank you. Mr Finlay. On the 16th of October this year, BAM were awarded a £170 million contract to upgrade the Aberdeen to Inverness rail line. How can it be that companies who have blacklisted workers are, one after another, being awarded multi-million pound contracts in clear defiance of Scottish Government procurement guidance that says they must take appropriate remedial action, which would include owning up, apologising and paying compensation, and proving that they have self-cleansed by employing some of the very people who they blacklisted in the first place? It, it is estimated that the AWPR will generate over £6 billion additional income for the North East, and I think that uh, the member needs to remember that 14,000 jobs are expected to be generated uh, along with that. Uh, it's anticipated that around 1,500 employees point will work on this project me, at its peak. Forgive me, Cabinet Secretary, a point of order from Mr Finlay. Uh, Deputy President Officer, I never mentioned the AWPR in my question. Not a point of order. Please continue. My apologies, Ms. Far, Ms. Cunningham. Sorry. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I've, if I've, if I've addressed the wrong issue. This is the, this, this, the principle is the same. But the, but the issue is one about uh, uh, if it's the network rail upgrade, the BAM contract. I think the member needs to be aware that we have no authority over network rail procurement in the first place. Uh, it effectively remains an arm's length body of the UK Department for Transport uh, with no direct accountability to the Scottish Government. Now, Network Rail also retains full operational and commercial responsibility for managing the railway infrastructure uh, within defined regulatory and uh, control frameworks, including all procurement activities related to their regulated infrastructure programme. Um, presiding officer, I, I can't be responsible for an organisation over which I'm not responsible. Point of order, Mr Finlay. I wonder if I maybe have helped in the Minister, uh, President Officer. The contract was awarded by Transport Scotland. That is not a point of order nonetheless. As you will be well aware, Mr Finlay, the answers that Ministers choose to give are a matter entirely for the Ministers. Question 8, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting young people into employment in the Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley constituency. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, the Government has invested in a wide range of employment initiatives which are directly helping to create sustainable employment opportunities for young people in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley uh, within the East Ayrshire Local Authority area. Some of these activities include uh, over the last three years supporting over 1,900 modern apprenticeship starts. Um, in the last three years, supporting 138 young people through Community Jobs Scotland and um, to uh, support the allocation of funding for 77 young people who face particular challenges in terms of employment and to support small employers to recruit MAs from the period July 2015 to March 2016 through the Scotland's Employer Recruitment Incentive. Thank you. Mr Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? She will be aware that since 2008 the number of school leavers and positive destinations in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley has increased by 4.7 per cent, while the number of school leavers in employment has increased by 4.2 per cent, which are both welcome if still slightly below the Scottish average. Could she outline what further measures the Government might be taking to close this gap, and in particular how we can assist youngsters with a disability to overcome their own particular barriers to employment? Mr. Uh, I, I know that the member takes a keen interest in, in the key issue of youth uh, employment and what I can say of course is that this government will do all that it can to ensure that young people can access the world of work and find sustainable employment and we have 
as I'm sure members will be aware, set a very ambitious target to reduce uh, youth unemployment by 40% by 2021. So whilst we have made considerable progress in terms of some of the initiatives I referred to uh, in my uh, first response, we recognise that there is more work always to be done. With respect to the specific issue of young people with a disability, we have embarked on a number of initiatives, including the SERI project, which I referred to a moment ago in answer to Mr Brown. Uh, in addition to the uh, general approach of that uh, employment recruitment incentive, um, uh, at the same time, there's a specific um, uh, uh, additional in-work support package available to support access for disabled young people. So we will continue to proceed with such initiatives to ensure that young disabled people have access to employment. Any thanks. Question 9, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you to ask the Scottish Government whether it's on target to create 30,000 apprenticeships a year by 2020. Annabel Ewing. Um, we currently are on target to deliver 30,000 new modern apprenticeship opportunities uh, each year by 2020. In 2015-2016, we have increased the number of opportunities to 25,500. Alex Ferguson, briefly, please. Um, thank you uh, for that response, Minister. And I do indeed welcome the fact uh, that last year's target was met, and, and I appreciate the new target that you've, you've told us about. Um, I do, however, have a concern that there appears to be a significant gender gap, uh, gender imbalance, and also very low numbers of people with disabilities undertaking apprenticeships. Can I simply ask what the Minister might, what action she might take to help to address that imbalance? Thank you. Briefly, Minister. Uh, yes, uh, well, we are uh, taking a number of initiatives to look at... Um, uh, gender segregation, to look at gender balance, to look at access on the part of, for example, uh, people with disabilities uh, to the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. Uh, there are a range of activities I can write in detail to the member because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but I would say also that we expect to see uh, published uh, in uh, uh, reasonably near term the um, Equalities Action Plan that we had promised to, uh, uh, to produce uh, and we will propose a number of initiatives in that as well. Many thanks. And we now move on to the next item of business, as that concludes questions. And we move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 145.